Welcome to Yoga Hype and History. In the dark this time, so we have less sunlight coming in from behind me in my little basement red uh, office type little zone that I that I come to you from. So today we're going to be talking about contemporary Hatha yoga amongst Hatha yogis. And we're going to be looking specifically at the work of the great Daniela Bevilacqua, who works with the Hatha Yoga Project and a couple of other projects and has been putting out just great publications the last few years and is a hoot. I really like running into her at conferences. So without further ado, let's get on with it for the day. So I'm sharing my screen and popping it up. And here we are, contemporary Hatha yogis. And I, as always, I'm Dr. Ulrey. Okay. So we're talking about the present day, and finally we have a woman scholar. I mean, we've been studying so many dudes. All the secondary scholars that I brought in have been um, have been male, well, as opposed to Anya Fox, and I brought in a couple of females. But I, I try to shoot for the greatest amount of gender parity I can, but I'm limited by the text in question. In my Hinduism class, I teach a lot of women. I make a point of it. So um, we have read another woman who was Danielle, or was uh, Stoller Miller, who did our translation of the Yoga Sutras. So Beth Lakwa is an ethnographer. So she works at, like I said, at the Hatha Yoga Project, and which was a multi-year European research project aiming to philologically study, publish, and translate texts of Hatha Yoga, but also to compare such studies and discoveries they found and these old school texts with contemporary ethnographic study. And they brought on Dr. Bevilacqua to do that. She studies Hatha yoga practice among renunciate yogis. Renunciate yogis are those yogis who have left their families. And in fact, they perform their own funerals and then they take on a new name because they are in a sense reborn into a new life. Um, they, in a way, they leave society, but they enter a new society that's made up of these other yogis and people called sadhus who are desiring liberation and magical powers. But I said she was an ethnographer. What's ethnography? Ethnography is a practice in anthropology. And anthropology is often translated as the study of man. But cultural anthropology is the study of culture, it's the study of humanity, the study of the history of consciousness even, or the ways consciousness moves about in different cultures. <clears throat> the anthropologist as an ethnographer will embed herself in a culture and write about everything she sees, including questions come up, strange conversations, interesting things they see, or just the structure of things. You can imagine an anthropologist just going and living with one group of people and looking at how they look at potatoes for a year. So a lot of ethnographers go and do a one year uh, period of field research during their dissertation writing periods when they do their PhD and they live embedded in a culture for a year trying to investigate some question. And during ethnography, they ask a lot of questions and they write a lot. So this type of writing uh, coined by thick by Clifford Geertz is called thick description in which you are describing as much as you can and about about everything you see and experience and looking at the implications of what you see and experience across that cultural matrix in which the anthropologist is embedded. So um, Bevilacqua notes that she spends a lot of time just hanging out with Hatha yogis and before she started working on the Hatha yoga project she'd done kind of extensive field work just hanging out with yoga types and renunciates all over India. She's fluent in Hindi. Um, she's Italian. She speaks excellent English. And she's producing some great translations uh, into Italian of a couple of important contemporary yoga works. So it's important when you're doing ethnography to learn to speak the language. You have to be able to speak the language of the people you're talking to. So you're always going to be an outsider. But gaining that entree through gaining faculty in the language really helps. Now, especially in uh, studying yogis, this is important because very few of them, unless they are more sophisticated, actually speak English. I know when I speak with yogis, I'm generally speaking with them in Hindi. So you just kind of take a lot of notes and you ask a lot of questions and you spend a lot of time trying to make observations. Now, Bevilacqua talks about how the key to a lot of her research is to just, like I said, hang out. Um, I knew an ethnographer at one time referred to his work as deep hanging out, like the description, deep hanging out. But she said what she'll do is she'll find renunciates and she'll hang out with them a lot. 
And like, if there's going to be an event or a gathering of other yogis, she'll try to get there a month in advance just so everybody gets to know her. She just shows up, asks questions, hang around. Um, so she builds sort of a rapport with people and she can easily move, move among these other, these renunciates. This is especially important if something happens that you can move easily in them. Now, there is a question of secrecy. And this is a problem in, the, in studying religion in general. She makes it clear that she's not initiated into any of these orders and that she does not want to know any secret knowledge. So she tells yogis very clearly, and this is an important thing, when you're talking to someone, you say, can I report on this? And she makes the point, of, don't tell me anything that I can't report on. That way I don't have to worry about it. So with secrecy, if you have to be initiated to learn something, then you have to figure out is it okay for me to tell it or not? Is it okay for me to write about it or not? Is it okay for me to mention it in passage to other scholars or not? If you're initiated, you got to worry about that. If you're not initiated and everybody you talk, you're like, by the way, I'm a researcher. I'm going to write about this. Then it's a little bit more on them. If they reveal the secret, then there are other complicated ethics. But there are always secrets in religion. And it's difficult as a scholar of religion to figure out what secrets can be told and what can't be told. Now, there is the option that if one is studying yoga, you can take initiation, such as um, James Mallinson has done. And he's even considered an elder and an officiant, an arhant, in a specific yoga group amongst the Ramnandis, in fact. So you got to ask yourself, if you're going to take initiation to study a group, then what can you say about that group? Now, some yogis consider the asanas they practice to be a secret. And they would say that the performing of those asanas to the public would be revealing of the secrets, especially if those secrets were the direct instructions from your guru, from your teacher, and nothing found in general practice or in a book or heck on TV and, and all over India today. So there is a thing where there were these sort of like yogi freak shows, um, for lack of a better term. And that's when yogis do sort of like They'll do yoga activities and show off either to beg for alms, to show the prestige of their guru or of themselves. Sometimes they'll just perform on the streets, you know, and some will do these performances to gain prestige, to gain money, whatever. Uh, and a lot of these Hatha yogis will, will perform kind of impressive Hatha yoga stuff, wondering if that will somehow make them famous. There's a great story that James Mallinson tells, and it's in the, the comic I assigned to you to take a look at. I think I had it recommended. And he talks about how he went to see this, you know, kind of very famous yogi teacher uh, and yogi performer. And the guy starts his yoga performance and it's impressive. But he turns on music in the background and it's modern big beat techno. So <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And then this guy is just doing these really complicated yoga moves. And then Mallinson thinks to himself, that's not found in any text. I think he probably learned those off the internet where you can find any number of videos of yogis, Western and Indian doing kind of crazy things. So it's kind of hard to tell the difference between a yogi who's doing extreme activities for religious practices versus one who wants fame or money. This is especially difficult with practices called ling practices, in which they will suspend blocks or heavy weights from their penises, even pull trucks with their penises. They'll wrap their penises around a stick and tuck it behind themselves and have someone tuck it behind their knees and have someone stand on it. I've seen guys doing this. And the question is, what is being demonstrated here? One, they'll say it's the fortitude of my celibacy gives me this power. Or you can see the strength of my sexual continence, my sexual power that is retrained, that is restrained, and that I can use it for these other ways. But other times, you're also like, what's the, why are these guys doing this wacky stuff? So um, once upon a time, you would find lots of pictures of yogis sitting on beds of nails. Did some of them take yogis standing on beds of nails or sitting on beds of nails as what we'll call a tapasya in just a second, or were they just doing it to attract people and get alms? It's hard to say. So, as I said, here's Bevilacqua hanging out with one of these guys who does Urdva Tap, where he always holds his arm up and you can see his nails are all gnarly and his arm is atrophied from holding his arm up all the time. She said she would just hang around a lot and in time she would be accepted. And then when she would go to new places, because everybody kind of knew her and see, saw her at other places, because these sadhus all talked to each other, they'd be like, oh, there's that Western woman who's interested in yoga. 
so uh, she would show up and she would get easy access to places because they recognize her from other places. In this sense, the ethnographer almost becomes like a professional friend. It's weird because you live in a place and you make these really close friends with people, but these are also the people you're studying. So it becomes a professional friendship. Or I remember in Nepal, my one of my host families where I was staying in an apartment in Harigaon, uh, was always saying, it's like, don't, they were always saying, oh, sometimes you have your research friends over, they would say, that by which they meant, like, if you go out to a village and you hang out and you make connections, sometimes they come into town and will stay with you. Um, and that does happen. Definitely happened to me. Um, so one of the things I did want to note is Bevelock was female. So sadhus, despite their vows of celibacy, may be eager to try to practice tantra forms of sexual practices, especially with foreigners. That's very common. Uh, she hasn't really talked about this, but I know when I hang around with yogis, if I have a woman with me, um, you have to be careful with these guys. So ethnography is not just limited to Asian cultures or what was once called a primitive culture, whatever a primitive culture is. One of my favorite ethnographies that I really enjoy reading is by Bruno Latour. And he did an ethnography where he was embedded in Southern California in research laboratories and worked on figuring out the social anthropology of scientific researchers. All right, so one of the things that we need to remember, and I'm just gonna state this before we move on, is that yogis consider asana practice, the practice of body positions to be called external yoga. So external yoga is like breathing practices, your yamas, your niyamas, your pranayama, the breathing practices, the asana body positions, but they consider the mental practices that are more meditative to be the most important ones. So who are these yogis, the contemporary yogis of these days? And I love this picture of this guy in the sunglasses. So these yogis are renunciates. They've left the world and they join a new world. And that new social world is one of yogis. And they are, in fact, social. These guys hang out together. You'll often see them in groups, sometimes individually. But while they have left society, they are a part of a new society. I know I knew one uh, guru who would always say, you know, you ask me, how could I give up my family? But the whole world becomes my family once I gave up my family. So many of them join what's called a lineage-based order. This is called a sampradaya, lineage-based order. So one guru and another guru and another guru. So your guru's guru is still your guru. Um, so we have, oh yeah, let me do some of these words. Samnyasin means uh, a renunciate. So to take sanyas means to renounce the world. Akara is a word that means something like a subclub or a family. Um, it refers to sort of subgroups within sampradayas, but also groups of wrestlers that would hang out are called akaras. I'll talk about wrestling at the end of this lecture. Um, the word sadhu just means good. It just means a good person, a good one or a good man. Um, Oh, also amongst the Akaras, what's interesting, I was just reading about this, and a, 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 another scholar friend of mine has documented this, that there is now an Akara of Hijras, of um, arguably in our Western term, uh, trans women who are recognized as being a spiritual subgroup as well in this one specific group of them. Okay, so these gentlemen, when you see them around, are just called sadhus, which means a good guy. They have their own world in which they wander. They go on pilgrimages. They hang out with other yogis. They hang out with their gurus. They sit around the fire when they're not doing their practices. Jim Mallinson wrote a lovely little article one time about how hard it is to just sit around and do nothing. You know, you do your yoga practice. You do your meditation. You do whatever you do for, you know, a couple hours a day. And then the rest of the time, you just sit around the fire. And you talk about spiritual things for the most part. But he says it's actually really hard to do nothing all the time. Um, so renunciates include nagas. So nagas mean naked sadhus. Like you see this naked sadhu here that wear ash on their bodies, but they are for the most part naked. Um, so there are naga sadhus are the ones that she was looking at a lot. And they're found amongst the Shaiva Dasnamis, also the not yogis, the ones who invented uh, Hatha Yoga and they have the big rings in their ears I've talked about before. Also, the Vaishnavas of Vishnu-oriented Vairagis were involved in a form of Vedanta called Vashishtadvaita. All right, so these are all different groups. So, like, um, this guy's clearly a Naga. I'm not sure what Naga he exactly type is. 
Uh, he looks like a dust Nami. And the guy to his left could be a Nop. Yeah, I think he's a Nop Yogi. You can tell them by how they look. And um, so these are very specific markings, but they almost all wear ashes. They'll have different things they wear on their hair, different jewelries and whatnot. Now, over a long time, these different types of sadhus have developed and each has their own types of deities they worship and their understandings of what salvation means. Um, what I want you to think about today is that all these characters can generally be considered Hatha yogis and Hatha yoga, yogi sadhus who are renunciates. They've left their families. They're not householders. They all kind of hang out without maintaining a social distinction. This is, this is an interesting thing, and I've noticed this, and I never put it into words, is that these guys are of all different orders, but you'll see them all hanging out together. They'll be of different orders, but they still hang around because they're unified by being sadhus. I'd be like if you had five different guys from five different baseball teams, they were unified by all playing baseball. You know, that wouldn't really work. Uh, okay. And maybe if they were all retired. So their defining characteristic, how you really know them to be sadhus, is they're celibate. And they would argue that no yoga performed would be effective for creating perfection or liberation without celibacy. Now, in the pre-modern yogic world, in the pre-modern era of India, the Indian ascetic landscape was fluid. And many of these sadhus would blend together with other religious groups that they are around. Like, so you see here, you have a Muslim holy man and a Hindu holy man. So we have quite a bit of evidence of not the yogis in particular would take a Persian name when they're around Muslims. We also have evidence of lots of these yogis would, you know, eat, would eat beef when they were around uh, Muslims and would eat pork when they were around Hindus, just to follow sort of the customs of the places. So they were unified by being renunciates who were seeking liberation and power. All right, so we have a wide range of texts about yoga, but the funny thing is few of these yogis have a knowledge of these texts. Bevilacqua argues that the ones that she would meet that do know texts and more esoteric philosophical readings about yoga were educated or from educated families. Now, likely yoga texts, including the Hatha Pradipika and all the, you know, even the yoga sutras and whatnot, were written by Brahmins who were working under specific patrons or rulers and recording specific teachings from specific gurus. So there's a problem with this text. Is the text a window or is the text a reflection? If the text is a window, it's a window to the past. And I look to the past and I say, ah, this is exactly how the world was in the past when I look at a text. Well, no text is exactly a window. Texts are more like a reflection. They're a reflection of the period you look at. So if you're looking at those sinister yogi stories, are you reading about yogis who are actual cannibals? I, well, the yogi in the story might be, but all yogis aren't cannibals. I'd say very few. I'd say probably no yogis are cannibals. But it's a reflection of the time that shows the tensions that people had over yogis. So are, when you're looking at a text, and especially when you're looking at scripture, you have to ask yourself, is this an accurate window to the past, or is this just another type of reflection of what the past may have been like, created by the people who were in the past, if you will? All right, so Hatha Yoga plus Tapasya. This is probably the key point to our reading today. So for the sadhus, it's really hard to separate out what is called Tapasya or Tap. Tapas means heat. It's a heat that's generated by doing painful things like staring at the sun for hours or staring into a fire for hours or standing on one's head for a year or always standing up. Uh, we have notions of tapas from the earliest era of Hinduism and tapas through ritual and whatnot was thought to generate this heat that was dangerous inside the person doing the tapas. It would be so dangerous that the gods would be afraid that the person would use it wrongly and destroy the earth. So the gods would come and say, let loose your tapas and let me give you a gift. And then hijinks ensue on that. But there is this idea that by doing painful things to the body and by painful bodily exertions and vows, one can generate this holy heat, which will create power uh, and will and is also considered a holy sanctified thing. So when we talk to, when, when Bevilacqua, in fact, talks to Hatha Yoga Sadhus, Hatha is not an esoteric term. It didn't mean something like the union of the sun and the moon or union with God. Now, Sadhus often have a sense that yoga means, that Hatha means forceful, but 
That hatta is usually explained with the Hindi term jabardash, jabardasti, which means enforcement or firm resolve from the Sanskrit jird sankalp, uh, from dridha sankalpa. So that means just like some vow or promise that you've held incredibly firmly. So there's no discussion of a union of the higher self or the lower self. Though I was thinking about how in the Bhagavad Gita, there is a discussion of realizing a God state in which one is absorbed in the experience of transcending limitation and transcending the world. So these practices, and we see a few of them over here, we see guys upside down, you see, um, and you also see an artistic depiction of this that's much older. So this is the uh, Viparita Asana, the upside down Asana in the noonday sun surrounded by burning cow dung. Why cow dung? Cow dung is preserved and dried and is used as a common fuel throughout India. So imagine you are in the heat of the Indian sun. So I'm talking about 108 degrees surrounded by bonfire standing on your head. Doing that obviously is going to generate some heat, but it's thought that you generate this holy heat through austerity. So their practices and the practices of lots of these Hatha yogis is about um, tapas. They may have some sort of asana use, but their behavior is more aligned with tapasya, the ascetic vows and practices thought to generate a holy heat that grants gifts from gods, supernatural perfection, and even salvation. The sadhus actually describe hatta as identical to tapasya. So other things are holding the arm up one time, all the time, or only standing and never lying down. Uh, this tap is called duni tap. Is duni means like a fire. Duni tap is upside down with fires around you in the sun. There's also jal tap, which means sitting in very cold water during the cold season for very long times in the winter. Some say tap is just only eating fruit and drinking juice. Uh, we also read in the reading today about a yogi who took a vow of maunam or mauna of silence. And he did that for a lot of years. And then he realized it was a problem because he uh, he could never talk to his friends and he couldn't communicate with others about his teachings. So then he took a, a vow that he would only speak between 8 p.m. and midnight at night. Okay, so um, there is kind of a history of yoga being dangerous and it's connected to this notion of tapas. So the Buddha who founded the, who founded Buddhism when he was on his quest for enlightenment, began doing extreme tapas in a place called the ascetic groves with all these other guys who are doing kind of stuff like these yogis are doing, but they weren't thinking of it as yoga. They were doing these extreme self-mortifications. And the Buddha realized at a certain point that he had to find a middle way between living a normal life and living extreme asceticism. And so out of Buddhism, there's a critique of doing tapas because it says it's going too far to one extreme. Also, we'll see that in the colonial era, they would, people would describe the Hatha yogis they'd seen doing this tapas and would describe it as like a perverse self-violence. So there was critique against yogis for that as well. Uh, these days, we'll also hear people saying that Hatha yoga, often conflating it with, conflating it with tapas, will say that Hatha yoga is dangerous. Some people will say that Hatha yoga will danger the body. Some yoga texts, especially Raja yoga texts, argue that anything that causes pa pain should not be done in yoga, that yoga should be comfortable. Now, um, what's interesting is Bevilacqua argues that yoga should not, this Hatha yoga should not be thought of as a yoga of force, and Birch argues this as well, but as a method of determination. Uh, and I'll talk about that more at the end, but she argues that the life of a Hatha yogi is one who has taken extreme vows and has an extreme lifestyle that they live out in the service of transcendence, magic powers, bodily immortality, devotion to the guru, devotion to God. Not as much devotion to God, but it's in there. Okay, so Hatha yoga does maintain the sort of hydraulic understandings in which the bindu or semen rises up through the central channel as we see in these diagrams. And they use the term kundalini. Well, we heard kundalini before. It's the coiled one, the coiled serpent that sleeps at the base of one's belly. And then when awakened, travels up the spine, progressively liberating the person. And she describes not yogi specifically saying that the yoga that they do as being uh, kundalini yoga. So one thing that I thought was interesting in this is she described, uh, she described the way blood becomes semen. 
And let me just go through this really quick. So the downward flowing blood, blood is thought to move downward and it's considered kacha or raw until it reaches sort of the testicle area. And then it's considered cooked. It's the blood is cooked into semen and it becomes paka, cooked or ripe. Therefore, it's either ejaculated and lost and more blood is needed to regenerate it or it's transformed and pushed up the spine. In this sense, the blood has been has been sort of condensed into semen and then the semen is retained and then is pushed in through seminal through either celibacy or through these practices to sort of push up further and do this thing for the body now this isn't limited to yoga generally it's accepted that a man loses so much of like his essence and his blood and his power by ejaculating um as as for women's ejaculation, there's there's not really a discussion of this or, or feminine orgasm or anything. There's no orgasm just, uh, talked about and this sort of notion um, of the of of of, of body fluids. So here's the thing: when even if you're reading in like Ayurveda or you're reading in other sort of things about um, nutrition and sort of traditional understandings of how the body works, a tremendous amount of milk goes to create a pint of blood, a tremendous amount of pints of blood is used just to make a tablespoon of semen. And then when you lose that, that's like losing all the milk you've drank and all the blood that's been made out of it. But if you retain that, then you can keep it within yourself and you're keeping all that blood and all that milk and everything inside of you. So that's there's almost like a notion of fluid dynamics there. Uh, yes, feminine sexual secretions can be considered rectus or seed, and treated in the same way, but there's little evidence for this being held actually, and there's next to no evidence of it being in the text. It's kind of still theoretical. All right, so what's the role of the guru in all of this? The guru for a hatha yogi is considered essential. Everything must be taught, not learned from a book. Many people will argue that learning from a book is not real knowledge. It has to come from the mouth of someone who knows things. The guru is considered enlightened, or at least on the way to enlightenment. Think of it this way. He's been to Chicago. Only someone who's been to Chicago can give you directions to go to Chicago. You can't just go to Chicago by looking at the map. You have to like get in the car and go there with the person. Maybe that doesn't quite work. Or have you ever built an airplane? I've never built an airplane. But if you talk to someone who has built an airplane, they can show you how to build an airplane. They can give you books on how to build an airplane, but I doubt you're going to be able to build an airplane. So only instruction from the guru's mouth can be counted on as uncorrupted and as true. Furthermore, most of these Hatha yogis are in a tradition which is called a Sampradaya. So the guru will initiate the Hatha yogi to join the order, but then the guru is also how he'll communicate to the other people up the line of guru upon guru upon guru. The guru facilitates contact with other ascetics in the order. And also if a guru has students living with him, he's sort of like the head of the household. He becomes sort of like the father of the community. Now, some yogis may not follow the actual teachings of their yogi by the letter because the because their religious practices have changed from how they were initially initially <clears throat> oh, sorry um <clears throat> so your guru who initiates you you call a diksha guru the guru who initiates one now the diksha guru will give a very specific set of practices. If the student who's been initiated becomes different, they might learn from other gurus, other sadhus. They might, you know, gain, they might gain a change in their personality, what they really like. Maybe they'll stop doing asana practice and start doing a lot of mantra practice. So if the student changes, so do their practices. All right, so what's the connection of asana and meditation? And remember, what do we hear about asana and the yoga sutras? Your asana should be firm and secure. And I'm looking over here and nothing about what this woman is doing look, is looking firm and secure. So um, Bevilacqua actually talks about having some of these yogis teach her some yoga because she practiced a little yoga once upon a time. One time when she was working with a lady sadhu, they just did a whole bunch of pranayama breathing and a little bit of stretching and that was it. Another one had her to have no warm up whatsoever and just did balancing and tons of asanas. And another one she studied with had her do all sorts of stretching and pranayama, but only have a few asanas that she would hold for a very long period of time. 
In fact, this sadhu said that the only way to perfect an asana is to hold it for a very long period of time. Yogis consider yoga that is performed with a religious component to be, or hold on, I said that wrong. Yogis consider yoga performed without a religious component, without the preliminaries, meditation, structures from the gurus to be just gymnastics. They would say that this are this gymnastics are good for people. And they will argue that it's good that there are like popular yoga teachers who teach lay people yoga, but they don't see this type of practice as being yoga in the sense that they practice. Some will see just the performance of yoga positions by a yogi to non-initiates and to non-yogis as being just crass. Yet other yogis will portray themselves, you know, doing all sorts of yogic stuff um, in order to uh, in order to show their prestige and whatnot. So uh, they would argue, in fact, most Hatha yogis argue that the most important aspect of yoga is dhyana and samadhi, absorption and meditation. These may be supported by asana or body positions, but they are realized, but real realization comes through meditation and the instruction of the guru. We see actually that yogis really stress the sort of seated positions of the body and that the non as being very good for meditation. The seated positions are good for meditation. We do have sculptural records of yogis doing all sorts of complicated sadhanas, like you can see here. <clears throat> Um, though it is unclear if these yogis are doing yoga as yoga or yoga as tapasya. So quite a bit of the work of yoga in the text and in practice is breath manipulation of pranayama. The breath is thought is thought to be steadily re reduced so that you're taking shallower and shallower breaths. And that is increasing the subtle energies in the body because they're not expelled by the breath. And we can also note that the word for the self or soul is atman, which comes from the Sanskrit root un, which means breath. And also, where does our word spirit come from? Inspire, respirate. So there's your little Indo-European concept, but not Indo-European word. So the aim is to make the body firm. Bevilacqua actually says that she did a bunch of yoga at one point in her life. Now she'll occasionally use yoga to resolve a specific body issue, especially when a yogi says, oh, you're having this problem. You're not sleeping well. You got a problem with your hip. Now your shoulder's bothering you. Do this yoga activity. Um, she'll do that. And she also says she just uses yoga to keep her body firm as sort of like exercise. Many sadhus say that doing too much asana practice is a distraction from the real work of meditation. Many also speak of doing lots of yoga practices, lots of asana practice until they either fix a medical problem or they get an experience of some sort of revelation in that practice. And then they abandon the postural practice to do more meditative practices. So the postural practices are always in service of greater meditative practices. Meditation is the key to make the body firm. So what about asana and exercise? So the yogis have some different ideas about asana practices. Seated asanas, as I said, are thought to be a stable place to support meditation. Also, there is a thing called yayam for making your body strong and supple. These are correlated with your non-seated yoga positions. We see evidence of yoga postures that are non-seated but we don't see many more than 15 of them until later. You may be wondering why I keep belching. I have to have a medical procedure later this week that will involve putting a camera in my throat, not an endoscopy, but they are embedding a camera in my throat to watch the way my guts react for a week. And before that, for a week, I have to be completely off antacids. So I am a belching, quivering, disgusting monster. Be glad that you don't have me teaching a class with you and I don't have to go and throw up a bile halfway through. But there'd be a yoga to that. Isn't that one of the preliminaries? Drinking a lot of yoga. I think that's Jagakarshini where one, or Gaja, Gaja, Gaja top or something like that, where one uh, swallows water and then vomits it out to cleanse the guts. Well, mine, I'm cleansed plenty. Okay, so excuse me. Anyway, so there is some overlap here with wrestling. And here's an interesting note. The word akara, um, in a very old usage of the term, is a place where people practice yoga. There's a long tradition or, uh, where people practice wrestling. There's a long tradition of wrestling practices and the traditional practices of wrestling, swinging weighted clubs to get strong and powerful, specific diets. You'll see a traditional wrestling uh, pit over here on the left where they actually wrestle not on mats, but on a very specific blend of sand and mud to sort of cushion blows and allow grip and whatnot. It's fascinating sort of stuff. 
Uh, so there's a long tradition of wrestling that includes activities that build strong bodies that are used to compete and also to fight uh, and battle. And some yogis use them. We actually see these vyayam. We see some yogic practices that are the same as these wrestling practices. And we even hear about some yogis hanging out in these wrestling communities as well. So there is an overlap between, yo between yoga and wrestling, and we just need to learn more about it. And I'd like to know a lot more about it. Okay, a lot of yogis will say that a, yo a yogi position is perfected when you can hold it at a very long time. Um, this will come up later again. I'll, I'll talk to you about this in later esoteric yoga. So finally, female yogis. Bevilacqua, in her years of research, has only met a few sadhus who are female. I think she said three. We have no evidence of yogi females in the text. The rare few are anomalous. And I think if they do come up, they're like more like literary figures than anything. The 20th century trend of females, as we see in modern postural yoga, predominantly practicing yoga, is exactly reversed in the pre-modern world and in the contemporary world of yogis. Yogis in general and yogi communities are male-dominated, male dominated, patriarchal, and for the most part, quite misogynistic. So not a lot of lady yogis. No hatha yoginis. All right, conclusions. Hatha yoga is synonymous with tapasya. Remember that. Tapasya is the holy heat, strong vowels, strong vows, body mortifications. And in the past, hatha yoga was also considered to be tapas. Though even the Bhagavad Gita states that yoga is better than tapas. And, then, and that yogis are better than people that do tapas. But they may be talking about a different type of yogi there. Uh, yogis were, in fact, considered tapaswins, practitioners of tapas. Physical performance was considered relatively minor, only to support the body, and physical practice was not just postures, but also preliminaries and manipulation of the energy channels through breathing and locks. Now, when I said was, I also mean is among these contemporary hatha yogis. Physical performance is minor and is only to support the body and to support meditation. Finally, hatha should be understood as method of determination. It is a vow and a lifestyle that aims to grant perfection and liberation. All right, see you next time. Bye-bye now.